heard that song before. It fits in with the Thanksgiving season, doesn't it? My dad told me one time, I was not very big. Somebody had a guitar at the house, and dad said, I can play that. And I've never seen my dad play a guitar. I'd heard he played a fiddle back in his younger days, but I'd never even had an inkling that he could play a guitar. And so he reached over and asked the visitor, to, said, let me see that thing. And I said, Dad, can you really play the guitar? He said, yeah. He said, I can. He said, you want me to play one for you? I said, yeah. I wanted to see him play it. He said, I'll play Bumblebee Hit the Barn. And he reached up and plucked that biggest string, and it went boing, and he slapped the guitar. He said, that's where the Bumblebee hit the barn. <laughs> and that was it. I can play behind the bridge. <laughs> First John chapter 5, verse 20. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll go through the end of the chapter, which is verse 21, but we're going to read the first two, first two verses, and then we'll look at the rest of it as we go through. In 1 John chapter number 5, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now see, Jesus was his human given name. Christ was the title that meant Messiah the deliverer of Israel. And so he's saying, whosoever believes that Jesus, the one that we have seen and, and touched and witnessed with our own eyes, that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Or in other words, if you love God, he's talking especially to those of the Jewish background, if you love Jehovah God, the one who begat Jesus, you'll love him who was begotten of the one you love, which is Jesus the Christ. Verse 2, by this we know. Now underline those two words, we know. We know. There's some things we know. Some things you think, some things you believe, some things you wonder about, some things you have an opinion on. But he's saying, here's some, here's some things we know. That's not a maybe. He said, we know. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Father, we pray that you'd bless us as we look at this last message, this last chapter of 1 John. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be settled in our own mind about the things we know about Jesus Christ. I pray that the sweet Holy Spirit would come and settle in amongst us and just help us, Lord, to be close to you, understand your word, and Lord, help us to go forth to live for you and be an influence among those that in our family and people we inter interact with throughout the day. I pray that you would bless us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our time together in a sermon ought to be a time of savoring a particular thought found in the Bible text. Now, you can, you can take any Bible text and you can look at it from different angles. And what you might see uh, as you read through it, something may really stand out to you and somebody else, for example, Two preachers. One may preach a sermon out of one passage of Scripture, and he may focus upon one thought in that passage that, that's on his heart. Another preacher looks at another thought, another idea that's strong in that passage. And so there's different ways. It's like looking at a diamond. If you have a diamond ring, you can look at it, and it has many facets, and you can look at that diamond, and it will, it will sparkle in one direction or the other. And somebody standing over here may see it sparkle on one facet and somebody else sees it sparkle on another. And so <clears throat> the preacher, for instance, who, who examines a passage of Scripture and he, he looks into that passage of Scripture, he reads it thoroughly, he looks at grammatical structure and punctuation and he does word studies on it and, and uh, he reads maybe background, historical background and to get the, the cultural context and, and he's... He's taking it apart and putting it together again. He's, he's looking at the geography involved with it and, 
and the history of it and maybe the, uh, the way those first century hearers would have, would have understood it. And so the preacher digs into all these areas. He may read dozens of commentaries. He may read the passage of Scripture 15 or 20 times. And, and he, may, uh, he may read other, other books that, or maybe sermons that other preachers have written on that same passage of Scripture. And so that's called uh, exegesis. He's digging down in it. He's digging up all the truths that he can find in there. And he's, uh, he's exegeting the Word of God. That's kind of like going into a mine and you're mining uh, gold, for instance, and so you're digging it out. When you first find gold or down here at Murfreesboro, you find a diamond in the diamond mine, they say that they look kind of ugly. You, know? they, you just see an old glistening piece of rock there. It's just covered with mud and dirt and stuff. So they take that diamond and they, they clean it and wash it, and then they take it and maybe have a jeweler, uh, someone who is skilled to uh, cut that diamond in the proper shape so that it can be used as jewelry and so forth. Maybe some of the chips are used to be diamond tips on saw blades and things like that. And so when we're, when we're digging into a passage of Scripture, we're mining those truths and pertinent information and putting it all together. But a preacher who does that, he's doing the right thing. But some, some preachers pride themselves in being exegetes and they preach exegetical messages instead of expository messages and the exegetical message turns out, I mean it could be the same passage that you might have heard other preachers preach on for 45 minutes. It might take an exegetical preacher and he might have enough material there to talk on for four hours because <laughs> he studied all this stuff and he just throws it all out there one thing after another just elements that he studied and it turns into be kind of a professor-like delivery that you might get in a seminary, but not very interesting and kind of dull, and we might look at it and say, boy, I don't think I got anything out of that that's going to help me in life. My, my wife tells me every once in a while, honey, be careful <clears throat> about how much you write down in your notes to tell the people. They know you studied a lot, but they don't want to know everything you studied. <laughs> and so the expositional preacher he does the exegetical study. He digs out those same truths, but then he goes through and prunes and finds the general idea, the theme of a passage, and he knows you can't use everything that he studied, so he puts it together into a, into a package, kind of like a chef might cook in the kitchen, he's got all these spices out and he's got all these ingredients out of the refrigerator and out of the cabinet and the cupboards and he's got the, he's got the bar covered with all these ingredients he's going to cook into a nice meal. But when he serves that meal, he doesn't put everything, he doesn't take all those bundles of spices and all of those bowls and packages of flour and, and put that on the table. He puts all that together in a recipe and then when he cooks it up, he takes what is edible after it's prepared and then he puts that on the table and it looks nice and tastes good and it provides a nutritious meal. Well, in this final chapter of John, First John, we're going to see that there may be some things that seem like, boy, First John's got a lot of disjointed stuff that don't seem to hook together. It's kind of like that shelf just bundling all those ingredients up and setting the ingredients on the table instead of a prepared meal. But when we see it together as a unit flowing from the rest of 1 John, we will see a meal that's a picnic basket of truths that we need for life. John uses the Apostle John. We've said we're in the school of the beloved Apostle. And this will be the final class from the school of the beloved Apostle tonight out of, Apostle, of the Apostle's little book we call 1 John. And there's one term that shows up all through 1 John. You know what it is? We talked about it just a minute ago. We... No. 
In verse 2, he says, by this we know. If you read on down through there, you'll see that he says it over and over again. He says it eight times we know, eight times in chapter 5. In the whole book of 1 John, he says it 39 times. Do you get the idea that the apostle John knows something and the people he's talking to, he's saying, this is stuff we can know. And so our theme tonight is things that a Christian can know, especially from 1 John. We know. We begin by looking at the very first thing in the first five verses of our chapter. We know, what do we know? We know we are the children of God. You know that? You've been born again? If you've been saved, you know how you got saved. We know. There's some things we may not know. All right? When we read through the Bible, <laughs> do you ever run across something you wonder about and you don't know? So do preachers, and so do theologians, so do seminary professors and everybody else. Nobody knows it all. <laughs> but John says here, there's some things we know. This is not opinion. This is not maybe and think so. There, there's some things we can know. And number one, we can know that we're the children of God. In verses one through five, we read the first two. Let's read verse three. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith I said this morning we'd be talking about something tonight that was akin to the idea of faith is the victory we overcome the world by faith faith is the victory doubts disappear when you know you're a child of God doubts disappear in a court of law, when, when one party has maybe sued another party and the judge doesn't know who's who and who's guilty or who's innocent or who's in the right or who's in the wrong, but when they begin to present, the lawyers get up and present the evidence, the evidence starts making things look clear. And so the evidence here that we see, I want you to see uh, at least four things here that Help us to know that we're the children of God. We're the children of God. Do you have doubts? <laughs> you can know that you're a child of God. He's, you can know by the love of God. I, I've given five words here. Believe, belong, bond, and bow. Believe, belong, bond, and bow. The love of God in the first part of verse number one. Look at this with me in verse number one. He says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You can know. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know that you're saved. So that's believing. So what's the second thing? The second evidence that, that our lawyer that's trying to prove we're saved might present. Well, first you believe. Well, you, you pretty well know if you believed or not. Secondly, love of the brethren. Look at the last part of verse number one. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. So when, when you've been born again, you'll begin to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. When I first got saved, there were some nuts in the church where I went. <laughs> I'm glad we don't have any nuts here, do we? <laughs> there were some nuts there. And before I got saved, I didn't care much for them. But I began to learn to love them after I got saved. And so... We're talking about believing. When you trusted Christ as Savior, you believe. That's an evidence that you know God. And the second thing is you belong by loving the brethren. That's why I like having church. We belong with one another. We belong. And when people are absent from the fellowship of the church for a long time they feel like a long t they come back into church they feel like a, a long tailed tomcat in a room full of rocking chairs you know just kind of feel out of place a little bit but we begin to have doubts about some things when we don't fellowship together so we know that we're believers when we trust Christ as Savior Belo belonging to the group belonging to the fellowship of the 
believers, helps you to have confidence and know that you belong to him because you love those others that believed on him too. Thirdly, this evidence that we know we're the children of God in verse 2 and 3 is the bond, love, o obedience. You're bonded to the Lord. You want to please him. Look at verse number <clears throat> verse number 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and, watch this, keep his commandments. <laughs> you know, when you're really born again, I mean, if you really love God, you really love God, you'll start loving the brethren. And when you love God and you love the brethren, you'll also, because you've been born again, you'll love his commandments. His commandments are not grievous because he wants us to do certain things and we want to please him. When we find ourselves trying to please God, that's another evidence that we know him because we want to please him. When I was a little kid, I wanted to please my parents. I didn't just obey them to avoid getting a whooping. <laughs> I didn't obey them just because I was afraid they were going to throw me out of the house. I obeyed my parents because I loved them. They were special. They were the most important people in my life. And that's normal. That's natural. And that's the way it ought to be, that kids love their parents and want to please them because they love them. I try to please God because I love him. That's an evidence that you really belong to God when you are loving to keep his commandments. When his commandments are not obnoxious to you, it's something that's dear and sweet, being able to please God. When you've done something, you've obeyed some commandment, you've obeyed some instruction of scripture, that makes you feel more secure in the family because you know you've pleased him. There's another fourth or third or fourth evidence. And we said believe, belong, bond, and bow is the last one. Bow, the love of holiness. Look at verse number four. And whatsoever is born of God does what? Overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory. Isn't that what we sing sometimes? Faith is the victory. We can have victory by overcoming the world through faith. And so this bowing before him is pursuing holiness. God intends for us to be holy. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. And so... There's things a Christian puts out of his life because those things are not expedient, as Apostle Paul says. All things are lawful to me, unto me, but not all things are expedient. I'm not going to lose my salvation no matter what I do, but because I want to be in good graces with God as his child, I want to put some things out of my life, and there's some things I want to put into my life. And when I put those things into my life, it's called holiness separated more from sin. The longer we live, the more we want to be separated from sin. And look, when people are living for Christ, when we are obeying the scriptures, when we are following after him, when we pursue holiness, we'll have more confidence that we do indeed belong to him. You know the most miserable people in the world? Not lost people. Who is it? Saved people who are living in sin. And you know what they start doing? When people are doing things they know they shouldn't be doing and the Holy Spirit's working on their heart and he's convicting them, he's putting the squeeze on them. Man, they're miserable. You can't be a Christian and enjoy being a drunkard. You can't be a Christian and enjoy being unfaithful to your wife or your husband. You can't be a Christian and enjoy being a thief. You can't be a Christian and enjoy staying out of church. Now, as we read this morning about Moses, there are pleasures of sin for a season, but the Christian knows that season is going to be short. True? And so when we're not pursuing holiness, we're not bowing before him and letting him be the guide of our life, doubts can creep in. 
And when somebody's miserable, they'll begin to doubt that they were ever saved. In 1 Peter, it says that, <clears throat> that people can even wonder if they were ever really born again. If we want to have confidence that we belong to him, we want to know for sure that we're his child. It's by these things. Believe, belong, bond, and bow. There's a second thing about what we know in this passage of Scripture. What do we know? First of all, we know we're the children of God. You can know that. <laughs> well, let me just skip ahead to verse 13. I want you to look at this. I've used it before. You're familiar with it. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. So you can know that you've got eternal life. I've talked to people before who says, well, I don't think you can know till you get there. Well, the problem with that is it would be way too late to do anything about it, wouldn't it? <laughs> and the scripture says that we can know. And so you can know that you're a child of God. But secondly, we know that Jesus is God. Verses 6 through 10. Let's read those. This is he that came, well, let's see. Yeah, verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You notice the Word is capitalized there. It's talking about Jesus Christ. He's called the Word in the Gospel of John. And so he's referring to the Blessed Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all mentioned here in verse 7. <clears throat> now the critics leave, the Bible critics, they leave verse 7 out. A lot of the modern translations leave verse 7 out. They say they don't belong in there. Well, I think we better be careful about cutting pieces out of the Bible, don't you? That's why I like the King James Bible. Not only am I convinced that it is the truth, the perfect Word of God, I like it <clears throat> because it doesn't leave things out. Uh, verse number 8, it says, the, These are the three that beareth witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. Now remember I said at the beginning, sometimes we look at 1 John and, and it's maybe kind of like Proverbs in a way. Have you ever read through Proverbs and you try to keep a focus on what the subject is as you're going through a chapter of Proverbs? <laughs> you know what the problem with that is in Proverbs? There's usually about two verses that go together and then the next two are different altogether. <laughs> That's all true in the Word of God. But Proverbs is a minefield for preachers trying to preach an expository message because you're going to find two verses and that's it. So you're not going to be able to lump a whole chapter together with one subject, one topic of it generally in the book of Proverbs. And here in 1 John, this can be a little bit intimidating. We read that and say, what did he just say? Well, he's saying there's some things we can know and we can know that Jesus is God and that comes into question. There were Gnostics in those days uh, when the Bible was written in the New Testament who doubted that Jesus was really God and some doubted that he was God all along. Some believed that at Jesus' baptism the Spirit came upon Jesus and he became the Christ at his baptism and then just before he went to the cross, maybe in the Garden of Gethsemane, that his Messiahship left him than it was only the human Jesus dying on the cross. Well, that's a bunch of bunk. And here, 1 John, the Apostle John, is trying to prove that Jesus was the Christ, the human Jesus and the deity of Christ is all combined into one individual. And <clears throat> this is a kind of a tricky little place here. But we have three witnesses there. If we're in a court of law again, you know, you're bringing out the evidence and you bring out the witnesses and so forth. In a court of law, you'd say, call first, first witness to the stand, please. Well, it would be the water. Okay, we heard the testimony of the water. Let's hear the testimony of witness number two. Who's that? That's the blood. Who's witness number three? That's the spirit, verses six through 10. 
And so a little bit tricky here. Let's, let's examine what's he talking about, this witness of the water. Verse number 6. And he, this is he that came by water and blood. What does that mean? He came by water and blood? Well, this is a, <laughs> this is a battlefield of theology. And I'm going to depart from practically every commentary I've read. I don't, I'm don't. i going to have to write my own commentary, I guess, because I don't find any I agree with here. <laughs> and I would challenge you, when you come to a difficult place in the Bible, be wise enough to consult the commentaries. It might be that they suggest maybe reading another passage of Scripture that would clear things up for you, give you some ideas you had not had yet. But when you know you're, you're on ground that's just opposite of what the commentator is saying, you don't have to believe the commentator. This is the Word of God. And it's its own best commentary. And right here, as far as the water and the blood, the water, they say, the commentators, the majority of them, will say the water here is the baptism of Jesus. This is when his ministry started. And so when he was baptized and John the Baptist recognized him as the Lamb of God, this is where Jesus' ministry started and his ministry on earth ended at the cross. And so they say that the water was the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist where he was recognized as the Messiah and then his ministry would expand then to till he went to the cross and then the blood of the shed on the cross would be the other witness well i'm taking a different a different position because i believe the bible says something different now, i'm not mad at any of those guys that that believe that they've got some good points and if you read all their arguments it'll make you pull your hair out <laughs> they they give a lot of good evidence but some of it don't don't agree with what I think the Bible is teaching. Go back in the Gospel of John. Remember the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, the same man who wrote 1 John. True? So let's go back and see what the same author, same inspired writer of Scripture said in John chapter 3. The story begins in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and Let's skip on down to verse number five. Well, <clears throat> no, let's don't. Let's go to verse three. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We all know about that, don't we? Got to be born again to see the kingdom of God. Verse four. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Now watch what Nicodemus has got in mind here. Nicodemus has one thing in mind. Jesus just told him you need to be born again to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is thinking, he's saying, well, I know I was born, but how can I be born again? Let's see what he's got on his mind. Verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he's talking about a physical birth. There's absolutely no doubt for anybody that wants to see the truth. He's, Nicodemus has got in mind, Jesus saying, I've got to be born a second time. He's thinking of the first birth being repeated. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of what? Water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, no, Nick, you squirrel head, you can't get born in your mother's womb a second time. You got to be born of the water and the spirit. So the first birth is the water. The second birth is by the spirit. The second birth is not a physical birth. How do we, what else reinforces the idea that the water here is the physical birth? When a woman has a baby, her water breaks. 
And that's the clue that she's given birth to a baby. I mean right away. <laughs> and so that's the physical birth. If it wouldn't do anybody any good to get, you couldn't get into heaven being born of the, of the body, the physical birth two times. Jesus said you got to be, yeah, you got to be born <laughs> physically or you, you're not even eligible to be a person. <laughs> but to be born a second time, to get into heaven, it's got to be a spiritual birth. Now let's read ahead. <clears throat> Verse 6, that which is born of the, what's the next word? Flesh. We're not talking about baptism here. The water that Jesus is talking about, Nicodemus seal, our Church of Christ friends say, well, see right there, it says in John chapter 3, you've got to be born of the water and the Spirit, so you've got to get in the baptistry water or you can't be born again. You can't be in the family of God. You can't enter into the church unless you're born of water. Got to get in the baptistry water. That's not what he's talking about at all. He ain't talking about the Jordan River and he ain't talking about a baptistry in a church house. He's talking about a fleshly, physical birth, the birth of water, because he says that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do you see the contrast there? Born of the flesh and born of the spirit. Getting in the baptistry is not being born of the flesh. <laughs> so Jesus clears it up pretty good right there. Now let's go back over to 1 John, same author, same God that inspired the author to write this book. And if we go back down to verse number 6 again, he says, this is he that came by water. Now let's stop right there. That same writer got water in mind. How did Jesus come into the earth? He was born of a virgin. And he had a physical birth. Same idea. I don't think it's talking about the Baptist, the baptistry of the Jordan River and John the Baptist at all. Now that's what all the all the commentators say. That's what he's talking about. I've read a bunch of them, try to find one that agrees with me, but they can all be wrong if they want to. <laughs> I just believe the Bible. And then he goes ahead and says, and the blood. So the, that birth, that physical birth, see we're talking about those knuckleheads that were trying to subvert the truth in the church saying that Jesus was, he, he wasn't deity until his baptism and then he stopped being the Messiah. He stopped being deity just before he went to the cross. And so John is refuting that idea, saying, look, there's a witness here. Jesus was born of the water, the virgin birth. There's nothing unusual about a baby being born unless it's God being born through a human mother, and that's big news. That's what we're celebrating in December, the birth, the incarnation of God himself being born a physical birth by a virgin. And so Jesus is fully man and fully God. And so he, right from the very beginning, he's been the God man at his birth. And that's what John is talking about here. There is proof because there's nothing unusual about an ordinary baby, but when God gets born as a baby, <laughs> that's big news. And then <clears throat> he couldn't be, you know, these are, we're talking about fundamentals of the faith. Fundamental of the faith is the virgin birth. And the fact that Jesus died on a cross for our sins is another fundamental of the faith, his vicarious suffering on the cross of Calvary, his blood, if you will. So we're talking about his virgin birth and his sacrificial death right here. And that, friend, is how we know that Jesus is God. Well, let's move on. To the next. I can see you wasn't very impressed with that. Uh, number three. <laughs> number three. What do we know by reading 1 John? Well, here in chapter 5, we can know something else. We can know believers have eternal life. 
verses 11 through 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us part-time life. No. <laughs> and this is the record that God has given to us temporary life. No. John's making it clear. He's given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You got eternal life the moment you get saved. If you can have eternal life for a split second, you've got it forever. You can't have eternal, one, or eternal life one minute and then be condemned to hell the next minute if you did something wrong. When you get eternal life, you're born again forever. See, salvation happens in a split Second, it happens in an instant, in a flash of an eye. You're born again. So if you've got eternal life right now, what have I got? Eternal life. Well, what if I do something wrong over here <laughs> a day or so later? If God was to take my eternal life from me, then it wasn't eternal life in the first place. See, words mean something. And he said, God said, I'm giving you eternal life, not temporary life, not life until you sin again. Not life until you have a bad thought. Not life until you let a curse word slip. Not life until you have a lustful thought. Not eternal life until you get lost again. He gives us eternal life. And that life is not dependent upon you, friend. It's dependent upon him. Eternal life. We know. Oh, I get weary talking to people that think you can be born again today and lost again tomorrow. God would be an Indian giver, wouldn't he? That's probably not politically correct to say anymore. <laughs> if he gives you eternal life, you've got the goods from now on. You've got a title deed in heaven. You see, when you get born again, God writes your name in the book of life. It's like if I wanted to give Brother Joey my Ford truck. I would take the title and sign it. There's no lien against it. Everybody ought to have vehicles like that, shouldn't they, Brother Joey? <laughs> you don't want to go in debt for a $9 million car. And so if I took my Ford truck, now he's got 200,000 miles on it, but he's got a million, so it don't make any difference. <laughs> I'd pull my title out. I'd sign the back of it put his name on the face of it and hand it to him. Now whose truck is it when I hand him that signed title? Whose? It's his. What if I change my mind tomorrow and I go back and say, Joey, <coughs> I want my truck back. It ain't mine. I've got no claim to it. I've signed it over to him. What if he does something next week I don't like? Well, that would be no different than every week. <laughs> what if he does something I don't like? I say, man, I gave you that truck. You've really disappointed me. Give it back. I have no legal claim to it. I gave it to him. I signed it over. Doesn't matter what he does. It's still his truck. When God gives you eternal life, he's written your name down as his child. And you ought to try to please him. You ought to try to live for him. But if you don't, you have a bad day and you backslide or you have a bad month and you backslide, <laughs> you know, that's sad. It's ungrateful. But that doesn't change the fact that he wrote your name down. You belong to him and nothing can change it. We know that we have eternal life. Fourth thing that we know out of 1 John chapter 5, we know that God answers prayers. Look at verse 14. It says there, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, according to his will, he heareth us. Verse 15. And if we know, there's that phrase again, boy, it just keeps popping up. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. 
we know God answers prayer. You ever get a little bit discouraged about your prayer life? <laughs> Say, boy, I just don't think I'm getting what I'm asking for. You ever feel like, come on, be honest. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't get what we're asking for. Well, the key is here. We know God answers prayer because he said so right here. Either God is true or he's not. Either his word is true or it's not. If his word is true, and it is, he says right here he's going to answer prayer. So what's the key? Look, it says in verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if, there's that little word, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. God wants to answer our prayers, but if we're, we're praying for things, as it says in James, to consume upon our own lust, that's not praying in his will. He's not going to give me, if I get tired of my wife and say, I think I want a younger one. Uh, I want a young, young, beautiful girl that's all pretty and, you know, young. And I start praying for that. You think God's going to answer that prayer? No, he wouldn't because I'd be dead. She'd kill me. <laughs> God's not interested in answering prayers. I, I worked in Oklahoma City out on the job one night. We, had, we were trimming out a house and one of the painters that was working in the neighborhood come, come in to visit with me and Pete. And he's, he told us he was a Christian. He's, he said he was thinking about leaving his wife. He found a young girl that he wanted to marry. I said, what makes you think God would bless that? He said, well, I, I've been praying about it and I, I believe that I believe it's God's will because I've been praying God and, and she's willing to go with me, so I think it's God's will. I said, you misunderstood God. <laughs> That's not God's will. And uh, he didn't like me telling him that, but hey, you got to shoot straight, right? And, and we can ask for things that's outside of God's will. He's not uh, obligated to give us something stupid, something harmful. I mean, what if your children ask for a rattlesnake? You going to give it to them? What if they want to drink some poison from out from under your kitchen sink? Are you going to let them? What if your three-year-old wants to drive your car without you in there? <laughs> you're going to let them? No, you're not going to give them something that's harmful to them, something outside your will. You, you just don't do that. And God's not going to do it with his children either. And we know God answers prayer, and if we pray in his will. See, the, here's the key. Have the mind of Jesus. Have the mind of Christ. And if we ask what's in his will, in other words, we ask the Father for the things that Jesus would ask for. If we ask the Father for things Jesus would pray for, he's going to answer those prayers. And that's the way we pray to get things that we want. The psalmist said that he would give us the desires of our heart. You've got to learn to desire the things that God wants in your life. In the will, praying in the will of God. We know that God answers prayer. Number five, we know that Christians shrink from sin. They are turned off by sin. Christians cringe at the thought of sin. Verse 16, look at it with me. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him Life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. In other words, we see a brother sinning, a, a sin. I mean, he's just doing the same old thing and, and God's chastised him and chastised him and chastised him and he's praying out of the will of God. Maybe like that painter who wanted to put his wife away and marry the younger one. Uh, if we see somebody who refuses to obey the Lord and ask for something in his will, we may as well not pray either because God's not going to do it. <laughs> if I'd have told that painter, y'all yeah, pray with you that God will give you that young girl. <laughs> I shouldn't pray that. If God's chastised him and God's about to take him home, my prayer ain't going to do anything. <laughs> but that's outside the will of God. The will of God is to straighten that guy up We know that Christians shrink away from sin. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Okay, careful right there. And we can almost say that somebody saved never sins again. Entire sanctification. That's what some of our... Uh, 
our friends in the Nazar old Nazarene churches and, and some of those like that, they believe that they would reach a point in life where they don't sin anymore. <laughs> I had a Sunday school teacher like that growing up. She was a free will Baptist, and she believed in entire sanctification. And somebody asked her if she sins anymore, and she said, I'll have you know I do not. <laughs> I thought to myself, Later, not then, I didn't have enough sense to think anything then. Later, I thought, when she said that, she just sinned, <laughs> the sin of pride. <laughs> well, what it does mean, now some, some, again, some theologians say that when you're born again, you don't practice sin. Well, there's a truth to that, but I don't think that's what that scripture is saying. Lot did practice sin but he was a righteous man. What it does mean is the spiritual man, the one born of the spirit, so you've got two natures, human nature and a spiritual nature, fleshly nature, carnal nature, and a spiritual nature. And the spiritual person has no desire to sin. Now who you surrender to, if you surrender to the spirit, You'll cringe and shrink away from sin. You won't want to have anything to do with it. That doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means it's your habit to avoid sin. The fleshly part of you wants to sin. And so that's why reading our Bible, having a devotion time, attending church, being in the meditation of the mode of meditation of, on the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, and holiness, that feeds your spiritual side so that you shrink from sin way more than you would if you feed the, the uh, fleshly nature, the carnal nature. That's why we ought to stay out of places that have carnal activities, not watch TVs and movies and go to shows that have carnality galore. The more we watch that stuff, the more we talk about that stuff, the more the carnal nature flourishes. But the truth here is we know that Christians shrink from sin. Verse 19, it says, And, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. We who are godly say, I, I belong to him. I can't participate in the vile, vulgar, sinful things of the world. We know that Christians will normally shrink away from sin. And at least we ought to feel that way. If you don't have some aversion to sin, if you don't have just a, a, a good measure of discouragement seeing sin, there's something wrong with your salvation. That's why I think people who vote in elections for abortion promoters, there's something wrong with that kind of Christianity. I'm not saying they're all lost, but I can't understand it. If they're not lost, I don't know how to explain it. Last thing, number six. Uh, we know what real life is. Verses 20 and 21. Well, we're just about to wrap this up. Verse 20 says, And we know, there's our words again, we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding. Christians understand some things that the world doesn't know. Given us an understanding, that's because the Spirit of God lives within us, that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. We know what real life is. Real life is like that life that God gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they fell into sin. Some people say, well, if God is love, why do we have all this why do we have all the sickness in the world and all the killings and all the wars and all the disease? If God loves us, the answer is he does love us, but he didn't cause all of this. 
man fell into sin in the Garden of Eden. And man defiled him, himself. And this world is a degenerate world because of that sin. God didn't do that. God created a... Sometimes people say, why doesn't God just create a perfect world? And the answer is, he did. <laughs> we messed it up. It's not his fault. Well, we know as a born-again Christian, because we have the Spirit of God living within us, we know what real life is. We know that going and rubbing bellies in a nightclub with somebody that we're not married to is, we know that's not real life. We know that guzzling down liquor and booze and trying to get drunk as a skunk is not real life. We know that sticking a needle in our veins and popping pills to get high is not real life. That's the fallen world. That's the, that's the world of sin. That's this world system. Real life is when we come to church and we sing praises to the Lord. Real life is about worshiping Him and praising Him and pleasing Him. Real life is when we come here and we can laugh together and have a good time. We can learn about the Lord and we can go out feeling pure and clean, not having been involved in the things of the world. That's real life. See, the world thinks that, well, if, if you don't want to get married... In fact, it's better if you don't get married. Just shack up together and try one another out for a few years and see if you really want to get married. <laughs> they think that's real life. Real life is when you're committed because you love God, you choose a mate, you get married the right way and live together as man and wife as God intended. Real life's not going out and seeing how many people you can have sex with. Real life is not going out and getting bombed out of your mind. Real life is not stealing, carousing. Real life is living for God. That's the way Adam and Eve were designed to live. They blew it and we've inherited their nature. These are things that we can know. We ought to teach our children very carefully what real life is. Real life is not seeing how close to sin we can get. Boy, I see that so much, even out of Christians. See how close to sin. Let's try to define sin in such a way that we can indulge in a few things and not get caught. Real life is when you're living to please Him and you'll stay a mile away from sin. That's real life. Things Christians can know. And we graduate tonight from the school of the beloved apostle. Let's pray together. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you that you've given us these guidelines by which we can know things that you deemed important for us to know. Now, Lord, we don't know everything. We admit that. But you've shown us some things in this passage of Scripture that we can know. And we pray that you'd help us to be dedicated, devoted Christians who want to show our love to you by obeying you. I pray that you'd bless our church. Lord, help us to reach folks for the cause of Christ. Help us to be dedicated in our hearts to be holy. And if you choose to make us happy because we're holy, then we get double blessed. But Lord, help us just to have these things anchored in our heart, things that we can know. Bless us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you need to pray at the altar, you're welcome to come. Maybe you need to be born again. Maybe somebody at home watching or listening somehow on the internet, you need to be born again. Instead of putting it off, why don't you just do it right now? God loves you. Jesus died for you and he'll save you if you'll trust him as your Savior. Maybe somebody needs to be baptized or join the church. You can do that. If you come... Meet me here. We'll talk and we'll pray about it. And God will give us an answer.
make sense to them, but that, that's just the way it is. We can't really expect the lost world to understand the things that we know. We ought to be arrogant about it, self-righteous. But we ought to be glad that we know some things that God meant for us to know. As she plays through one more verse, 